Good evening and welcome. We're so grateful to God that we could come together like this. You know, normally on the first to the third of every month, we it's like a tithe of our time to the Lord in fasting and prayer. And this year, the Lord had asked me to take those three days that we spend in the Word and each night to share the Word or each day to share the Word of God with those who are watching, those at church. And so for the family of Good News Center, I am grateful to God that we could do this. And tonight we're so excited that we can come before God and seek His face. Can you imagine the, the night before Jesus was going to die and the things that must have been happening, the preparation that was taking place? It is the first of April. And I know for many it might be April's Fool's Day, but there's no fooling around about this subject, the subject of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And we as believers have such an amazing opportunity to celebrate the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So at this point, I want to encourage you. I know you may be going through stuff, maybe things that are happening in your life. I encourage you to share Send us your prayer request. Send us on a WhatsApp message or send a text message to the number that is on the screen. Or you can send us an email to prayer at goodnewscenter.org. I know God is able to do exceedingly abundant. And we look forward to what God is going to do this weekend. Tonight, we have an exciting message from the servant of God, Pastor Cecil Verasami, who is going to share the Word of God with us tonight. And we're anticipating tomorrow for Pastor Kevin to share the word with us on our Good, Front, good Friday celebration service. God has something amazing in store. And then don't forget, Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we are believing God for an amazing time in the presence of God. I am going to be sharing on that Resurrection Sunday. Now, just one more thing that I have to remind those who are the family of Good News Center. Don't forget that we're back again uh, with in-person worship. So we're going to be here with Courtyard Praise at 10 a.m. Central African time. For those of us who are here in South Africa, remember, it's Courtyard Praise at 10 a.m. Let's get ready for an exciting word from God as the servant of the Lord delivers this powerful message. Amen. God bless you.
evening, family of Good News Center. I'd like to greet you and welcome you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this beautiful, glorious Thursday evening. Uh, I pray that, that you'll have been enjoying this holy week of the Passover and we celebrate the feast of the Passover. Truly, it's a very integral part in the life of a Christian but in the same time, we don't want to get uh, bogged down with the crucifixion in a sense that we need to understand what it is the Passover all about. Now, I know sometimes because of the secular world in which we live in, people know more about the Easter bunny than they do about the Passover. And sometimes, even for us within the church, we, we also misinterpret the message of the Passover. I say that because our focus on the Passover is about how God delivered his people, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt and he led them to the promised land. Yes, that's only part of the story. Because we also need to understand the circumstances and the detail of that redemption. Because it, if we don't get a grasp of what it took and why uh, God delivered them in the way that he did, we won't understand how his redemption plan for us here today works. So this evening, our uh, Judeo put me on the spot and he asked me to give a title for my message. Well, if you need a title for my message is, well, actually it's a question and now pastor has been posing a lot of questions. So let me jump on the same bandwagon. Who's your master? The basics of my scripture this evening is from Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 24. The Bible says, No one can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. As some interpretations of the scripture says, you cannot serve God and money. So I just want to leave that scripture with you, but just go back to the story of the Passover. The story of the Passover is recorded in Exodus chapter 12. So we can read from verse 1. Now it may be a bit of a read, but I want us to understand some details within this story. And I'm going to focus on certain points just for the purpose of this message. Amen. If you've got your Bible, let's just read. Now, the backdrop to the story. The children of Israel were in Egypt from the time that Joseph went there and he was the uh, the one in checking in charge in, the, in Egypt, and the Jacob and the rest of his brothers moved over to Egypt, and they settled it. And the Bible says that over the years after Joseph had died, there rose another leader, another pharaoh in Egypt, who didn't know of the exploits of Joseph. And so the people of Israel began to grow, they began to multiply, and they were becoming very prosperous. So the people of Egypt became jealous. And then Pharaoh said, hey, if we don't control this people, they will overpower us, even with the vast majority of them. So what the children of Egypt, what the well, children of Egypt, what they did was they took the Israelites as slaves. And the Bible says they put on them hard tasks to perform. And the children of Israel were being burdened by the children of Egypt. And so we see much was required of them there to 
uh, work by day and work by night, and the more they complain, the more uh, the tasks were added to them. And so they were in a place of real bondage because there was no escape from their situation. And they began to cry out to the Lord. Then the Bible says God raised Moses, and then he sent, chose Moses to lead his people out of Israel. And then when Moses went to, to, to Pharaoh, now we know that there were 10 plagues that God had sent over the children of Egypt so that Pharaoh would release the children of Israel. Well, we're not going to discuss the other nine, but we're going to focus on this one, the 10th plague, which is why we celebrate, not because of the plague, but what God did during this time. And so Passover is, where we, is the backdrop to the story. So reading from Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 31. Exodus 12, verse 31. Then the Bible said, Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel. And go, no, I've gone ahead of the story. Sorry, let's read from verse 1. <laughs> Forgive me. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to, to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house Take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it. With a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Amen. I'll stop there, because everything that I want to say is contained in those few passages of Scripture. Now, as I said, the children of Israel were in Egypt, and they were under bondage, because they were slaves to the Egyptian people. And Pharaoh had a cruel hold on him because for each plague, when it was over, he increased the workload. So the children of Israel were really burdened. But I want us to uh, understand or, or 
how the story of the Passover is just a foreshadow of what it is right now. Firstly, when we talk about Egypt, Egypt is a place of bondage. It is a place, it's not a geographical location. When we talk about Egypt, in our time that we're living in, it's not about the place in North Africa, that's Egypt. No, we are talking about a place of bondage. In society today, I don't know where you are. I don't know where others are. But what I do know is the enemy or the God of this world has taken captive the people. Now in Egypt, I said the children of Israel were slaves. But you must also understand that it was not just the children of Israel that were slaves. The children of Egypt were also slaves because you are a slave to what controls you. So the children of Egypt, although they were the masters of the children of Israel, they were still slaves to Pharaoh because at the end of the day, it was Pharaoh who controlled Egypt. So sometimes, even if I bring the story to where we are right now, for the people of Egypt, they were like, were not slaves because they were free, they could do what they want, and they were prospering. But when the plagues came, Pharaoh, because of his selfishness, because of his stubbornness, he refused to let the children of Israel leave. And so because he made that decision, it was unfortunate that the children of Egypt also had to uh, fall foul to those plagues. So all those frogs, all those flies, and all of those plagues that came, came upon the entire nation of Egypt because they were slaves to Pharaoh. And because of his decision not to let them go, they had to endure those plagues. Why am I telling you this? Because you, as I said in the beginning, what is my, uh, the title of our message? Who is your master? Now, in the ch for the children of Israel, they wanted to leave Egypt so that they could go and serve their God. So their master, their master was the Lord God Almighty. In Egypt, they couldn't do that because in Egypt, Pharaoh was God. So in the same light, in the time that we are living in, we need to understand, are we children of God or are we children of this world? Or are we children of Israel? Or are we slaves to the God of this world? Or the prince of the earth? Satan has taken hold of this earth because we know the story of Adam and how he sinned and how the enemy took over. In the same manner now, there is a choice. You can either serve God or you can serve the Satan. I'm going to leave that thought there and we'll come back to it. Then I want to move on to Pharaoh. As I said, Pharaoh is a type of Satan in a sense that he had control over Egypt, but he was fueled and he was governed by his own selfish desires. Whatever he wanted to do, everybody had to do it. So there may have been a portion of the children of Egypt by the second plague. They must be saying, hey, send these people away. We, we, we can't endure. But unfortunately, they were bound because they were slaves to Pharaoh. Then the next uh, character or the next uh, part of the, the, the story I want us to focus on is the lamb. The lamb 
for me, is the crux of this Passover. Because the lamb had to be without spot, without blemish. The lamb had to be completely destroyed. There couldn't be any leftovers. So the lamb paid with its life. And it was the blood of the lamb that was applied on the doorposts and on the lintels of the windows. So at the end of the day, when the angel of death passed over Egypt, when he saw the blood of the lamb, he passed over those houses and then the firstborn was not touched. Now, when the, uh, God gave the instructions to Moses, he gave specific details on how they need to prepare the lamb. He gave specific details on how they need to consume the lamb. Because God loves a bride. That's why I said, just don't put boilage or anything. Just put it on a roast. So that's why we, I also love brides. But anyway, that's bad. So even as they followed the instructions. Now just say for argument's sake. That they didn't follow something in that uh, instruction. Just say that they took any lamb. Guaranteed, the firstborn in that household died. If they didn't, uh, if they, somebody didn't like the bride, they can know, let's just, they reckon, they said, let's boil the lamb. Too bad, death came to your house. So you had to follow everything that God said in order to, to uh, survive the plague of death. So even as the angel of death passed over, it was how the lamb was consumed, how the blood was applied. It was everything of how you followed the instructions. Did you do it according to how God commanded or did you do it your own way? Well, guaranteed, if you didn't do it the way God commanded it, death visited your house. And then the other thing on the focus on the lamb. God gave very specific instructions of when you are eating the lamb, you got to tuck your, your cloak under your belt. That means you must have your belt tied around you. You must have sandals on your feet and you must have your stuff in your hand. Now, I don't know about you, but generally when we come home, First thing we do, we kick off our sandals. If you, as muscular as I am, you loosen your belt just so that your uh, tummy can breathe a little. And you just want to sit back, nothing in your hands, and relax. Because that is your comfort zone. But here God was telling them, when you consume this lamb, I want you all to... Because this is how I get ready to go to work. Have my bell tucked in, have my uh, uh, stuff in my hand. Okay, we don't get any stuffs now, but you, your lunch in your hand. <laughs> you don't forget your lunch. You can... So you, you prepare yourself for activity. You prepare yourself to go do something. So in the evening when you come, you just throw everything and you take your feet off and relax. But I want us to understand the mindset of what God was doing. God was, in a, in a way, was telling them, hey, I want to take you out of your comfort zone. Get ready, because we are going to go on a journey. I'm going to take you somewhere. So today, deliverance is going to come to you. But are you ready to leave? Imagine now if you're ready to leave, and when they say go, you, you're running around looking for your belts, you're looking for your sandals, you're looking for your stuff. But then, Pharaoh would have changed his mind. Because when God says move, believe me, you got to be ready to move. So in the same light, carry the same thought, even as we come into this modern time. And then finally we see 
when the plague came over Egypt, if you followed the instructions the way God commanded you to, and you applied the blood of the, on, the, on the doorposts and on the lintels of the windows, you were saved, or the firstborn in your family was saved. And so we see the children of Israel got through that as the angel of the dead passed over their household. And so finally Pharaoh said, okay, leave. Please just pack up and go. And the people that they were slaves to gave them gold, gave them clothing, gave them livestock. They just wanted to get rid of them. But at the end of the day, they left. But the story doesn't end there. Because God said, I will take you to a place flowing with milk and honey. I will take you to a land that I have promised. So God took them out of Egypt, and he was taking them to the land of Canaan. Now we know through history and to, from what we've learned is that it wasn't a, a, a far distance. It wasn't a 40-year journey. It was a two weeks or something or so journey. But God took them a roundabout way. It took them 40 years to get from Egypt into the promised land. Now we all question why, oh, when, or why did God do that? But you see, God was preparing them for a place. He had the place. The place was ready for the people. But God was getting the people ready for the place. Because if God had taken them the short way, any difficulty they would have experienced, they would have ran back to Egypt. So God took them in a way where they had to forget Egypt, where Egypt had to come out of their system so that when they come into the place, they will know that it was God that delivered them. It was God that led them. So you see, even as they left Egypt, and then if you follow the story, you know, they faced the Red Sea. They started mourning. Moses, you took us out of Egypt to die here. God delivered them. They went into the wilderness. They didn't have food to eat. God gave them manna. After a few days, they lost their manners because, Lord, we're sick and tired of manna. We want meat. So God gave them. Lucky enough, they ate the whole land. The Bible said you had to consume the whole land. But after a while, they wanted meat. So God sent meat, the quails, and, and they wanted water. He gave them water from the rock. So there was nothing that they needed. But what, what was God showing them in all of this? What was God showing them? God was showing them, hey, if you trust in me, if you just be obedient to what I am telling you to do, you will lack nothing. Amen. Just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust me. And then I will lead you, and I will take you to where I want you to be. But unfortunately, we see finally... When they came to the promised land, they sent out some spies in Numbers chapter 13. You can read the story. They sent some spies to spy out the land. And when they went to spy out the land, the Bible says they were excited because the land was a truly, they said this is a land flowing with milk and honey. They were amazed at the fruit and how beautiful it was. But then again, they became afraid because they saw the people that inhabited the land. They saw that they were giants. They saw that these guys were big and strong, and the cities around them had strong walls and very fortified cities. And so they became afraid. And so because of their unbelief, the Bible said, because you all refused to trust me, it was only Caleb and Joshua that said, hey, we can take these people on. Let us go in and let us take the city. But the rest of the 10 other spies convinced the people, hey, we can't do it. And so God was angry with them. And he said, this generation shall not enter into the promised land. And we see the entire generation 
didn't enter into the promised land. It was only Caleb and Joshua from that generation that went in. So what am I saying in all of the story? Pass over for that generation was of no effect. Because when they could have, when they died, they could have died in Egypt, but they didn't die in Egypt, they died in the wilderness. So they died not experiencing the benefit of the Passover. They died not fully understanding that God had taken them out of something and he was taking them into something. And because of their unbelief, because they refused to trust in him, they lost out on the opportunity to inhabit the promised land. So now bringing the story to us here today, the Bible says that God so loved the world. He saw the world was in bondage under Satan. And when people are crying out, now even if you look around us, people are in, uh, uh, in a crisis situation because there's so much that is happening. People are being depressed. People are being oppressed. People are being suppressed. All of these things are happening and people are crying out. And a lot of them, are, all of them are saying, where is God? Why is he not listening? But the Bible says that God has provided a way out of the situation. You are in bondage. And so he sent his son to redeem us out of that bondage. So if you are in a place right now of depression, if you are in a place right now of oppression, if you are at a place now where you don't know where to turn to, I want to tell you first, you are in Egypt. And when the angel of death passes over you, you got no chance because you are marked for death. But God has provided an opportunity for you. If you receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior Jesus, as the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if you receive, receive him as the Lord and Savior, if you believe and trust in God, the Bible says the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary is applied over your life on the altar of heaven. And so you now, where you were once marked for death, you are now marked for life. So God, through the precious blood of Jesus, has redeemed us from being slaves to Satan. But the Bible says you are now slaves to righteousness, to God. So you may ask the question, hey, why would I want to be a slave? Because I'm a slave to Satan, I'm a slave to God. Well, unfortunately, that is the only choice you have. Because if you're not a slave to the righteousness, if you are not a slave to God, then you are a slave to the enemy. Where the enemy, under his slavery, you are marked for death. But under the Lord's slavery, you are marked for life. I mean, that's a no-brainer right there. Because the blood of Jesus has transferred us out of darkness and into light. He has transferred us out of death and into life. So now, I ask the question, whom will you serve? Who is your master? Is Satan your master and he has you marked for death? Because the Bible says... The wages of sin is death. Yes. But the gift of God is eternal life. So the, your, if Satan's your master, then death is your wages. But if God is your master, then life is the gift that God gives you. So it's, it boggles my mind that people would choose to earn the wage of death rather than just accept the gift of life, but so it may be because the Bible says the God of this age has blinded the minds of the people. So the people may think, hey, I'm not serving Satan, or I'm not a Satan worshiper, I'm not a, uh, I don't go to church, I'm just for myself. There is no such thing. You're either serving God or you're serving Satan. 
So if I ask you, if you're serving God, then you have life. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have received life. And you are now no longer a slave to your selfish desires. You ought, to, in Romans chapter 6, it talks about, verse 22, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to our carnal desires. No longer do I do the things that I feel like doing. When I'm angry and when I hit somebody, I don't hit out. If I uh, uh, see what my neighbor got, I don't cover those things because those are, uh, are desires of death. Those are desires when you are a slave to the enemy because you don't have a choice because your carnality forces you to go and do that. Just like a slave doesn't have a choice. Whatever instruction is master decrees, the slave has to carry it out. So unfortunately, the devil is a liar, is a deceiver, is a thief, is a murderer, is all of those things. And when he wants you to carry out his orders, I'm sorry, you'll have no choice because you're a slave to the enemy. But this morning, God has made a way for us through the precious blood of Jesus, where we can pass over from death into life. All we have to do is to receive the blood of Jesus. You say, Lord, I receive your salvation of your son. The Bible says, unfortunately, by default, we are born as slaves of the of the world because the bible says for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of god in other words we all are born as slaves to the world because satan has taken control of this world and he has taken control of men and women across the nations so unless we receive jesus we have no choice but to serve the devil but this morning the bible says Jesus made a way so that we can pass over. But in, jo in John chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, he is saying, I've got a land that I've promised for you. So, Pass over from death to life. So receive me as the sacrificial lamb, as the lamb of the Passover. Receive the blood of Jesus so that death will pass over you. But it's not enough for death to pass over because you can survive the Passover, but what's the use of surviving the Passover when you are going to die in the desert? I might as well stay in Egypt and die in Egypt. So it's important that we understand that receiving the blood of Jesus is good. It's great. It's the most important decision that you could ever make. But there's something that goes beyond passing over. And I refer to it as crossing over. So we pass over. Praise God. I'm glad that you pass over. But make every effort. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, the children of Israel died in the desert. They didn't enter into the promise because of their unbelief, because of their murmuring, because of their complaining, because they didn't trust God, they didn't enter in or they didn't cross over into the promised land. In this like manner, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have passed over from death to life. But the Bible said, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So if you receive Jesus and you die, hey, well, praise God. You've reached a place that God has prepared for you. But if you are living, you need to make every effort. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says, we need to make every effort to enter into that rest. So, now that you've passed over, you've been passed over from death into life. 
Now you need to make every effort that you cross over from this world into the place that God has prepared for you. Now the place that God has prepared for you is the place where he is. Because Jesus said, where I am, there you may be also. If there's one thing that God always does, he always prepares the place first. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in the end, he created, not in the end, later on he created man. So he created the place, and then he put man in the place that he created. He had a promised land for them. So he took them out of Egypt into the promised land. God has a place for every single one of us. I'm not talking about heaven being that place. Eventually, we will get into heaven when we pass on. But when you are in the earth, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. So the Lord has a secret place for you and I. And we must make every effort to enter into that rest that he has prepared for us. So how do we make that effort? The Bible says, now that you've been transferred out of the slavery or to death and to sin, you now become a slave to righteousness. Romans chapter 6, you can read about this, being transferred from slavery to righteousness. So we have to live a life that is pleasing to our Father. Just like how he gave specific instructions for the children of Israel in how they need to pass over. In the same manner, to cross over, God has given you specific instructions. And to know that instruction, you got to know his word. We got to understand his word. We got to be obedient to his word. So you see, there is no longer a sacrifice required. I say that, but I'm going to contradict myself just now. But we'll get there just now. You don't have to sacrifice anything. There's no more death required. It's now about receiving the promise that God has for us. It is now about getting into a place with God and knowing that no matter what you go through, quit the murmuring, quit the grumbling, quit all the, 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 the uh, nonsense that we've been uh, uh, talking about. As soon as we face a situation, oh, where are you, Lord, and panic, the Bible said you need to come to a place of rest. And that place of rest is in God in knowing who God is, in knowing that no matter what you're facing, your God will see you through. Abba Father said, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. But even at this time, the Bible pastor on Tuesday spoke about, why are you fearful? Do not be afraid, he says, but yet we are fearful. He says, in no matter what the storms may come and the winds may blow, know that I am in the boat. I am with you. So whatever challenge you're going through, whatever you're facing, know that the promise of God is yea and amen. In the sense that whatever God said he will do, we've got to have the faith and the trust in him to know that he will see us through. So Passover, as I said, was good. But it's the crossing over that is just as important. Passover was the sacrifice that Jesus made. Yeah. Jesus was the lamb for Passover. He was the sacrificial life for the Passover. He gave his life. And he didn't give his just, he gave his everything. There was nothing more that Jesus could give for us. He paid with his life. The Bible says every drop of blood was drained out of his body. That means there was no life because the life of the blood is of the flesh is in the blood. So if there's no blood, there's no life. So he gave his everything. So Jesus died, and because of his death, we have been passed over from death into life. So he went from life to death so that we could go from death to life. 
But the Bible says that when Jesus died and we received Jesus, we are baptized in, with him into that death. So we died with Jesus and we rose with Jesus. So we no longer have to be afraid of anything because God is our master. He is our shepherd. He is our leader. And so if God is our master, then must you not obey your master? Because the Bible says you cannot have two masters. You can either have, you either serve one or the other. So the Bible says, if you have, uh, so I am saying, if you have passed over into righteousness, if you have passed over from death to life, then you have an obligation or you have a, uh, uh, a mandatory duty to carry out the instructions of your master. Now, if you're looking at Matthew chapter 6, let's go back to just before verse 24. He talks about treasures. So wherever you lay your treasure, that is where your heart is. Amen? Let's read that so I don't get it wrong. The Bible says in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So you recall when the children of Israel took, uh, when they had to eat the lamb, they had to follow three things. Their belt, the uh, their coat had to be tucked into their belt. They had to have sandals on their feet. And they had to have the staff. Meaning, Egypt wasn't their location anymore. God was taking them out of there into a place. So God was taking them out of their comfort zone to another place. So when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have to understand that this world is not our home. The Bible says, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So while we are here on the earth, we have to be ready for that place. So we have to have the belt of righteousness, the belt of truth. We have to have our feet shot with the gospel of the peace. We got to have our staff in our hand, but our staff is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So with these three things, we walk on this earth. The Bible says we are in this world, but we are not of this world because we are just now in our wilderness period. We are going through this world because we are getting into the place that God has prepared for us. So the Bible says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So if you make this earth your treasure, if the gold, the silver, and the things of this world are your treasures, then tell me what? Then I'll tell you what. You're going to kick off your sandals. You're going to loosen your belt. You're going to lay down your stuff because you are at home. Because this is where your treasure is. But when you're the child of God, you understand and you recognize that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through it because I'm going to cross over into the place where God has for me. And because my mindset is set on the things that are above, my mind is set on the things that are eternal. Uh, being a slave to this world means that I will die in this world. But when you're a slave to the most high God, you will die to eternal life. Imagine that. Imagine you died to, to eternal life. So you can't even die because God has promised you eternal life. And now what would you choose? So as a, I can't understand why we would choose to want to be here. Why we would want to choose to be slaves of this world. When rather we should be slaves to righteousness. The Bible says, uh, the, the, uh, Paul said, it is the love of Christ that compels me. In other words... I'm a slave to the love of God inside of me. 
maybe you don't want to do something, but when the God inside of you is going to urge you, he's going to push you, he's going to make you do things uh, like Jesus said, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. Because why? No longer do I have a will. No longer do I have a, uh, any agenda. I surrender it all because, Lord, you are now my master, and I choose to serve you. So, I said a lot of things, but I just want us to understand that it's not good enough just to pass over. I want to encourage you to make every effort to cross over. These are my, uh, just to make it poetic. Don't, Passover was great. Passover is what Jesus did. Crossover is what we need to do. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb for the Passover. His death and the blood applied on the altar of God. What does Romans chapter 12 verse 1 say? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So if Jesus was a sacrifice for the Passover, then for the crossing over, you are the sacrifice. Where you sacrifice all of your selfish desires. You say, Lord, I lay my life on the altar. There's nothing in me. Just like how the whole lamb was consumed. Lord, consume me. Burn away the wood, the chaff, the A. Lord, purify me like gold. Anything that you want to do, Lord, I want to do. I'm dying to myself. I'm dying to my carnal nature. I'm dying to the things of this world so that I can please you. So that is what being a living sacrifice, meaning you lay aside all of your selfishness and you say, Lord, here I am as your servant. Do unto me as you will. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a right attitude so that I could serve you as my master. Just like how Jesus said, Let this, that I might have the mind of Christ where the humility and the, and, and the love will just flow because I know God for all that you have done for me, for all that you've seen me through, for all the times of oh God that when I thought I couldn't make it, Lord, I've learned to trust in you. I've learned to lean on you. I know that even though I may face mountains, but if you are with me, I know that I shall overcome. Though the devil may come against me, but I know that he will flee a thousand ways because my God is more than enough. Because I serve a great and a mighty God. So I'll leave you with this question this evening. Who is your master? You cannot have two masters. You either serve the Lord Jesus Christ or you're serving Satan. If you say you're serving God, then you need to be obedient to the things that God wants you to do. So even in this time, as we celebrate Passover, I want to introduce crossing over. Because Passover was a price paid for our sin. Death was required, so God paid the price for that. But crossing over, he can't guarantee it because it's what you got to do. It is your choice. It is what you have to do in order to know that at a time when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and we stand before our Heavenly Father, he can reach out and say, enter into your rest. Well done, my good and faithful servant. So once again, I want to encourage you. Make every effort, according to Hebrews chapter, chapter 4, verse 11, make every effort to cross over into the rest that God had prepared for us. Amen. So even in this time of this Passover, and even as we go into the Good Friday and the crucifixion, sometimes... Uh, we are full with mourning, and, and some of us have this sad expression. Yes, we don't want to nullify or make of no effect what Jesus went through. We fully understand 
But if you don't understand why he did what he did, then you are making his death of no effect. You are making the price that he paid of no effect. So the only way to show Jesus how much we love him and how much we are grateful for what he has done, you ought to live a life that is pleasing to him. You have to live your life according to the instructions of your master. Don't say if you're a slave to, the, to righteousness when you are following your own selfish desires. You're only fooling yourself. If you say you're a slave to righteousness, then you have to know the word of God, you have to apply the word of God, and you have to be obedient. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. Shall we pray? Our dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for this opportunity to call upon your name. Lord, truly our hearts are full with praise, with gratitude, O oh God, when we consider, O oh God, the sacrifice that you made on that cross, that through your precious blood that is forever applied on the altar of heaven, it is the blood of Jesus that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It is the blood of Jesus that has set us free from the curse of death. And so, Lord, we give you all the praise, the, gl the glory, and the honor that you loved us, O oh God, to shed your life, your blood for us, O oh God. But Lord, I pray this evening hour for my brothers and my sisters, that every single one of us, O oh God, that we will not just uh, uh, accept your death and think that we have made it, O oh God, but Lord, for each day that we live, we need your presence. We need you, O oh God, to lead us, to direct us, O oh God, because we don't want to be slaves to sin. We don't want to be slaves to our selfish desires but Lord, we want to be slaves to righteousness, O oh God, knowing that you are our Lord, you are our God, and even as you have declared and decreed, Father, we want to be obedient to your voice, O oh God. Father, we cannot do it on our own strength, so that is why you gave us Holy Spirit, because what the law was not able to do, Lord, by your Spirit in us, O oh God, we are able to overcome, O oh God, and even as you teach us your word, teach us the truth of your word so that we could apply it in our life and that we will not just pass over but that we will cross over oh God into the place that you have prepared for us and so I thank you once again oh God I give you all the praise I give you all the glory and give you all the honor because we know oh God that you oh Lord God will never leave us nor will you forsake us for you are our shepherd thank you and we give you all the praise in the name of Jesus Amen. 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 Good night. God bless. Wow, what an amazing word of God. Thank you, Pastor Cecil, for delivering that message from the Lord for us today. I know that you received something. And our prayer is that you continue delving in the word of God. Stay in the word of God. Make that move. Cross over. Come to the place that the Lord wants you to be at. God has something amazing in store for you. Amen. Now, once again, let me remind you, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we are going to be live streaming our services on YouTube and Facebook again. And then at 10 a.m., here in person, 16 Netley Place is Courtyard Praise. We look forward to you joining us for the celebration. And then Sunday morning, 9 a.m. is our live stream service on YouTube and Facebook again. And at 10 a.m. is Courtyard Praise in person at 16 Netley Place, Malvern, KwaZulu Natal. Now, I know God has things that He's doing in your life. Share with us. Let us know what's happening. Like our page. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. Tell us all the things that God is doing in your lives, and we will be praying for you. We are going to be keeping you updated with exciting things that's coming ahead. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful weekend. And remember, it's all about Jesus.